you would please stand for the reading of God's Word. Scripture passage this morning is Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hands are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Thank you. You may be seated. Periodically, in the senior high class, I'll take a break from the curricula and, and allow the students to anonymously ask questions. And the way I do this is I'll just put my cell phone number up on the board, on the whiteboard behind me, and, and I'll give them a minute or two, and they can text a question to me. And I have to say that in, in periodically doing that over the past few years, I've had some fantastic questions. And, and the way I preface it is, as long as you're honest, as long as you're respectful, ask whatever you want. Nothing's off limits. And a couple things that that, that has facilitated is it allows the students to ask a question, something that, that is truly on their hearts or their minds, something that they desperately want to know about um, or what, what God's Word says about this or that. It also allows me to see where they're at. And for a teacher, that's, that's an important thing, to, to gain some insight into what they're thinking, what they're struggling with, what, what's on their minds, what's on their hearts. And third and finally, it allows us to look into Scripture with anticipation, knowing that God indeed speaks of the issues of life. I'm convinced that there's nothing that we as humans encounter deeply that, that God does not address. This, is, this book is alive. It speaks life to us. A few years back, one of the questions that I received from a student, this is a fantastic question, and, and I've got some, some excellent questions, but one of them, actually it's two questions together. The first one was, what is real worship. What is real worship? And this is one thing I love about, about teenagers. They're honest. They want to know the real thing. They don't want to know how to come in and, and do worship. They want to know what is real worship. What is the core of it? What is the irreducible elements of worship? And the second question that's related to it is why does God command us to worship him? Have you ever thought about that? Why does God command us to worship him? That's a fantastic question. Because we're tempted to think that that God is just, in his word, telling us, hey, you should should worship me. It seems like to be a vain thing. Worship me. This is something, actually, when I got this question, I thought to myself, well, this is, this, is, this is wonderful because there's a great deal of depth in this answer. And, and I had known that because this is something that I had struggled with. Perhaps it's something that you have struggled with. Why does God command that we worship him? I discovered that one author who I admire greatly also struggled with this same thing. And, and he did so and articulated it in, in a way that is unsurpassed that I have found in, in my readings. And the person that I'm speaking of is C.S. Lewis. Let me read to you what Lewis said regarding God commanding us to worship. He said, We all despise the man who demands continued assurance of his own virtue 
intelligence, or delightfulness. We despise still more the crowd of people around every dictator, every millionaire, every celebrity who gratify that demand. Thus, a picture, at once ludicrous and horrible, both of God and of his worshipers, threatened to appear in my mind. The Psalms were especially troublesome in this way. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord with me. Praise him. Worse still was the statement put into God's own mouth, Whosoever offereth me thanks praises me. He honors me. It was hideously like saying, What I most want is to be told that I am good and great. It was extremely distressing. It made one think what one least wanted to think. Gratitude to God, reverence to Him, obedience to Him, I thought I could understand. Not this perpetual eulogy. You see, before Lewis became a believer, he wrestled with this. As a matter of fact, this was one of the things that that admittedly kept him from worshiping God and and from becoming a Christian. Because he, he also said elsewhere that that God commanding us to worship him sounds like a vain woman seeking compliments. Yet, he came to this realization. He said, but the most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or of anything, strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or giving of honor. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise, unless shyness or fear of boring others is deliberately brought in to check it. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, like Romeo praises Juliet. Readers, their favorite poet. Walkers praise the countryside. Players praising their favorite game. Praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians or scholars. Except where intolerably adverse circumstances interfere, praise almost seems to be inner health made audible. I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that magnificent? The solemnists in telling everyone to praise God are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. My whole more general difficulty about the praise of God depended on my absurdly denying to us as regards the supremely valuable, what we delight to do, what indeed we can't help doing about everything else we value. You see it? When passages like this one in Psalms tell us to praise God, what what it's doing is inviting us to enjoy Him. Inviting us to enjoy God. Inviting us to find Him for who he is, good and great. This, as Lewis noted, this is something that we do naturally. Whenever you go and see a a, a great movie, what do you do when you're done? You want to tell somebody about it. You want to share that. And you want to invite others to have the same experience that you had. That's what the psalm is speaking of here. Inviting us to enjoy him. Further, Think of it this way. We are invited to glorify the greatest good in all the universe. It just happens to be God. We are invited to do what God does and seek His own glory because He is good and He alone is worthy. You could say that God wouldn't even be God if He did not glorify Himself because He is the greatest good. And so here, the psalmist invites us to do this. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. A couple of years ago, I was taking a a class, and one of the assignments for this class was 
to read and write a critique of a journal article. It's pretty common in some of the classes and seminaries. So um, as long as it was a scholarly, peer-reviewed article, you're free to choose what, whatever you want. And so I, found that I came across this article, and I cannot for the life of me remember the, the author of it. I had never heard of him before. Um, but he was speaking of worship. And the article spoke of worship being this thing that we as people have that we can give to God. And the text that this author used was Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this passage. But it states, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And, and as I read through and combed through this article, and even as I began putting together a critique on it, I have to say that there were, there were some parts of it that I, that I disagreed with. Not at all that I disagree with this passage that he was using for it, but his perspective, I, I saw where he was coming from, but I had to disagree. Here's why. It seemed to convey the idea that we have something like worship that we can give to God. The reality is, we have nothing to give to God. There is nothing that we can come in service and bring to Him and say, here, here's something that you lack, here's something that you need. I don't come into this service with anything to give. I come here because I am bankrupt and I am broken. And I know that the world out there has all kinds of promises to bring fulfillment and happiness and it has failed. That's why I'm here. I'm not here to give anything. Who can give anything to God? Everything is His. And while I understood where the article was going, and, and with this passage in particular in Romans 12, we cannot forget Romans chapter 1 through chapter 11, where Paul makes it very clear that we desperately need God and His grace, and God doesn't need us. We need Him. Elsewhere in the Psalms, the psalmist writes, As the deer pants for the waters, so longs my soul for you, O God. That deer doesn't bring anything to that river. That deer has nothing to give that body of water. Nothing. It comes to take. It comes because it is thirsty. And it desires. It desires to be filled. This is why God commands us to worship Him. He's inviting us to be satisfied with Him. We sometimes are so easily satisfied. Maybe far too easily satisfied with other things. And all of us, as we're going to see here this morning... All of us, everyone in here, everyone who has ever lived, worships something. You can't divide the world into people who worship and people who don't. There's no such thing as people who don't worship. But you can divide them by what they worship. We all worship something. In verse 3 of this passage, notice, it says, For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. That last phrase there, a great king above all gods, does that mean that, you know, maybe, maybe this verse or this section of the verse is just sort of left over from primitive antiquity? We're beyond that now, right? We live in a civilized society. We don't have gods. We don't worship many gods, really. Don't think that, because we do. Anything can be a God. Money, prestige, position, relationships, possessions, fill in the blank. Satan doesn't care what you worship as long as it's not God. Anything, anything that we assign ultimate value to, anything that we align our lives according to, these things 
steal our hearts. They steal our desires. And even though sometimes, oftentimes, they are good things. Relationships. Maybe a good relationship, but when we look at it as needing it above everything else, it will destroy us. And it will not satisfy. It cannot satisfy. There was a a false god spoken of in scripture by the name of Molech. And and this god in particular, um, according to his priests, the priests of this god, required a great deal from his worshipers. As a matter of fact, he required the offering of their sons or daughters, child sacrifices. It was really a terrible, terrible thing when, when... thinking that this thing, whatever it is, can somehow bring happiness, somehow bring fulfillment, somehow bring purpose, and so I must give to it everything, what I hold most dear. And so people would come and they would bring their children, and they would, there would be this statue like this of Molech with his arms outstretched, and and the child would be laid there, and a fire would be stoked under it, and the child would burn to death. And then the priest would pound on drums to drown out the sound of the screaming. This is a terrible thing. And we think, oh, well, we live in a civilized nation. We don't, we don't do those things. Let me paint this picture for you. A young girl falls in love with a guy. He tells her that, that he loves her and that she's everything to him and will never leave, etc. And uh, she believes him. And she gets pregnant. And upon finding out that he's going to be a father, the man tells her, well, if you love me, get rid of it, or I'm gone. This happens. How terrible. Because for this young woman, she has put everything in her life and she has aligned her life to the opinions and thoughts of this loser. And so she offers her child up. This happens. The things in our society that that steal our hearts and our affections destroy us. They destroy us. They never satisfy. We were not made to worship these things, but we were made to worship. We were made to worship God. And so the psalmist here, in encouraging us to worship God, he's not telling us that we have to conjure up some sort of emotion or some sort of feeling or something, that we have to make something out of nothing, and that's what worship is. No. He's telling us to take our worship from whatever is keeping it, our affection, the thing that we value most, and transfer it to God. That's what worship is. It's a transferring of what we, our devotion to the things that we love and transferring it to God away from these other things. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Everybody worships something. Everybody. I once heard this statement, and this, I believe, is, this is absolutely true. That the, the opposite of Christianity is not atheism. The opposite of Christianity is idolatry. Because you're either worshiping the creator or you're worshiping the creative. There is no other option. So the question this morning is... What is it that has our heart? What is it that has our mind and our affection? True worship requires three things of us. Our intellect, we think about it. Our emotions, we see this here. This language of emotion. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Shout joyfully. And third, our will. Let us worship and bow down, verse 6. Let us kneel. That's language of submission. It desires our will. 
And this is true of everything that is worship. It takes from us. And God is the only thing that gives. All these other things that take is never satisfied. The reason in cultures past when we had this sort of overt polytheism, this worship of all these gods, you think, how in the world could that have come about? Well, it comes about because we desire to worship something. And when we start giving to something, we think, oh, it's never enough. It's never satisfied. Because it isn't. But God, He doesn't require that. He gives to us. He gives, out of His limitless power, He gives to us. And we, just as the deer who pants for the water, we come because we are broken and empty. And, and the world, all these things that we, that we try to align ourselves to that, that promise to give us happiness and, and purpose, when we find out that they don't, we come to church. That's why we come here. Because all these things are broken and empty. And we see them for what they are. In 2008, there was a a man who was extremely wealthy up until that time, an investor, and when the bottom started to fall out in the financial world, he lost everything. Now, he lost all his money. To him, it was everything. And he ended his own life because to him, there was nothing else. He had given all of himself to this one thing, and now it was gone. Folks, I, I know I don't have to tell many of you this because you know that anything and everything in this life can be taken from you. Money, relationships, prestige, whatever. You can lose it. You can't lose God. If I were to ask would you give up the thing that you hold most dear to God? The, the typical Christian answer is, yes, I would give anything up for God. But if I ask you to give up the thing that is most dear, perhaps we should answer, no, I can't, because that thing is God. He is what I hold most dear. But everything else is on the table. Everything else can be lost. In this passage, we find four elements of worship. The first one, fellowship. If you notice, this is all in the plural. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us, etc. It's in the plural. Fellowship is a part of worship. I'm not saying that, that individual worship is not valuable. It is. Those of you who have, who have had experiences in worship by yourself, it's a wonderful thing. But it longs to be with others. And worship is fully realized when we are among believers, when we are in congregation, when we are in community. Why is that? because not every one of us in here has the same perspective on God. We, we emphasize perhaps different attributes of God. Or, depending on the circumstances of our lives, different things of God are illuminated to us in different ways. Just like if I were to hold a, a diamond up here, or a precious stone, all of you have different perspectives on it. And you're going to see something a little bit different. And if I were to turn it so you could see someone else's perspective, it changes. Let me give another example of this. A couple of years ago, my wife and I had our first child, Cecilia. And it's been, it's been an amazing blessing, an amazing uh, journey since then um, in our family and our lives. We've also, about a month, mm, five weeks ago, God blessed us with twins, twin girls, and so um, if I act like I 
haven't slept. I have, actually. My wife graciously let me sleep last night, so I don't know why I would appear that way, except for the fact that the past five weeks I've been sleeping a lot. Um, but my wife looks lovely, even though she hasn't slept too much this morning and last night. But um, something I realized, you know, when you, when you find out you're going to have your first child, you go through thoughts in your head like, okay, things are going to change. And they do. But I remember thinking, and, and Johanna and I had talked about this, that, you know, yeah, we're not going to have as much time just one-on-one. You know, so, so in a sense, and this, I guess, is a selfish way to look at it, but in a sense, I'm like, well, I guess I, I, I lose a little bit of you. I lose a little bit of that time there with you. Um, however, what I came to realize was this. When our daughter was born, being a mother, it, it, it drew something out of my wife. It drew something out that's beautiful that, that I know was there, but I just hadn't seen it because she wasn't a mother before. She was just a, a wife. And so now, with this other person in our, in our lives, and now with, with two more, it, it draws more. I'm not getting less of her. I'm actually getting more. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Just like in fellowship, we're not dividing God's attention in how many people are here. We're getting more of him. We're experiencing more of him in fellowship. That's the first part. Fellowship. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. The second thing is truth. Notice some of the language here. It says, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. It speaks of God as a great king above other gods. It speaks of God as possessor of heaven and earth. It speaks of God as our maker, verse 6. It speaks of God as our shepherd, verse 7. The psalmist is not saying, oh, I like to think of God like a rock. I like to think of God as our shepherd. I like to think of him as this or that. It's not just a, I like to think of him in, in a certain way. It's he is actually these things. These are objective realities about God that we can derive from the scriptures, from the prophets, we know that he is the maker of heaven and earth. We know that he is the shepherd. We know that he is the rock of our salvation. Think about that. Your salvation doesn't depend on you. That's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. He is the rock. Truth. I know we live in a culture that says, well, if you, if you like this or that from different religions, just take it, piece it together. A little bit of Christianity, a little bit of Judaism, a little bit of Shintoism, Taoism, whatever. Just put them together. But what do you have? You have just a fake collage. You have nothing. And not only in doing that do you not have a real God, what you have is you're going to be alienated in worship because only you has that God. We all come together worshiping the same God. So truth. Thirdly, his presence. Now this is something that is a bit paradoxical. Because you could say, isn't, isn't the presence of God everywhere? Yes, it is. There is nowhere that he is not. However, his intimate presence his focus. We long for this. And this is, this is what worship does. It longs for the very presence of God. We read elsewhere in the Psalms, Psalm 51, where David says, Take not thy presence from me. Elsewhere, the prophet Isaiah cries out, Rent the heavens and come down. Desires to enter the presence of God. Throughout the Old Testament, especially in the wilderness wanderings of the Israelites, God gave the instruction to them to build a tabernacle. It's like a big tent, kind of, where, where God's presence could reside. And that they could throw this tent up, 
and, and they could conduct worship. They could enter, at least the priests could enter the presence of God through sacrifices because he is holy. But God, that was God's idea because he desired to be among his people. And whenever they wandered, they traveled more, they would pack it up and they would go. And so that the presence of God was with them. Emmanuel, God with us. And then in John chapter 1, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then down in verse 14 of that same chapter, it says, And the Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. You think, that version doesn't say that. Tabernacle means dwelling. And to the Jewish audience, that's what they would have heard. The Logos, the Word, has been made flesh and has His dwelling among us, tabernacled among us. See, the wonderful thing is, not only do we desire the presence of God, He desires us to desire that presence. Worship is established in such a way that we are most satisfied and God is most glorified. He is glorified by us desiring Him and seeking His presence, seeking His face. And finally, peace. If you continue in, in Psalm 95 toward the end, it gives a warning. Let me just read this. In verse 8, Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation, and said, They are people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, Truly they shall not enter into my rest. True worship brings peace. It brings rest. Because we know that it's done. It's accomplished. We can rest from our, our workings. As I said earlier, we bring nothing before God. We offer nothing to Him. And this rest and this peace comes from realizing that. That He invites us to come even though we have nothing. And we are nothing. But he makes us his own. He dwells with us. He allows us to come into his presence because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as I close this morning, and we go forth from here, remember that we are always worshiping something. I always have to remind myself that even though things are wonderful and things happen in life and and we have various desires and wants and likes, when those things start, start to take our heart, take our affection, start to define us, then we need to step back and remember that, that these things are nothing, that God is everything. We always are worshiping something. May it be the great God, the King above all gods. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have made a way that we can come into your presence. You give us peace. You bring us into fellowship and you give us your truth. I thank you so much for that. I thank you that in worship we find you and we find all of these things that we deeply desire. And we begin to see all these other things in the world for what they are as nothing compared to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Rick and Linda Grissom are here this morning. If you would like to, as I close, if you want to come forward and uh, if you have questions or if you want to speak to them about uh, the message this morning or about joining the church or becoming a believer, I encourage you to do so. I'm going to close this with a benediction, and following the benediction, you're dismissed. Now may the grace of God the Father the love of God the Son, and the communion of God the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all till our Savior come and evermore. Amen.